Thank you, Elaine. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, as Elaine said, uh, this is going to be a comparison of fiber versus wireless. Uh, I want to tell you a few things about what this presentation is not. This is not intended to promote one technology over the other. Uh, we certainly don't want to exaggerate the capabilities of wireless, um, even though we are, in fact, a wireless uh, equipment manufacturer. We believe that there is a role for both technologies in uh, high capacity networks. What we would like to do is simply prevent the, present the facts as we know them. And the goal here is at the end of the presentation, you'll have a better understanding for where high capacity wireless can fit in the construction of a broadband network. And along the way, we will address some of the common mis misconceptions about wireless that, that we hear from people in the marketplace. So there obviously are a lot of drivers today in uh, the marketplace, things that are enabling broadband networks, uh, notably the billions of dollars in government funding coming from several different sources. It's really injected a lot of uh, needed capital into closing the digital divide in this country. And of course, we all welcome that. Uh, we see that still, well, despite all of the money that's been spent over the last decade or more, we still have 70% of this country in rural areas where uh, what we consider to be high capacity broadband is still not available. And as you probably know, um, the current administration is trying to pass a bill that would uh, earmark an additional $100 billion to closing that digital divide. So it, it truly is an exciting time to be in this, in this marketplace, no matter what end of the market you're in. In addition to the money, there are uh, frequency, new frequencies coming into the market that have really allowed uh, growth and opened up new applications. You probably know that the CBRS auctions are complete. And what that's done is really created a lot of excitement in the private LTE sector. So local governments are looking at private LTE for public safety applications, for um, uh, Internet of Things applications where parking meters and other uh, facilities in government are uh, connected. And all of these things are going to require high capacity backbones, whether they're fiber or wireless, uh, it's driving more demand for those technologies. All, again, a good thing. And then finally, the one we're probably all familiar with, and I don't think a trend that we'll see um, diminish at all is the work from home, um, take classes from home. I think we can all agree that that trend is going to continue. Um, while ultimately we will get back to some semblance of normal and business travel, I personally feel that we've learned a lot can be done remotely and learning uh, can be done remotely in, in some situations. That all places a greater demand on broadband networks and creates more opportunity for all of us. Okay, there we go having trouble advancing slides. So these are factors that go come into play in every broadband project. Not all of these factors will have equal weight in every project, but most of the time they're all going to be present. And depending on the project, one might take priority over another. So for example, you might have time to market as your most important consideration in a particular project. Perhaps you've got a neighborhood um, that you want to get uh, online and start collecting revenue and, and beat your competition to the market. In another example, uh, capacity might be the most important consideration for your project. You might have a segment of your network that needs to support hundreds of your customers and that segment needs to be multiple, multiple gigabits. 
So in that example, capacity would be the most important challenge you face for the project. Oftentimes, there will be, you'll need to balance um, these challenges. You might have uh, want uh, to expand your coverage and range, but you have a budget that you need to do that within. And so what we hope you'll see here is you'll learn where uh, wireless can be uh, helpful and where uh, fiber is, is necessary to meet these various challenges. I think we can all agree that in rural deployments, um, wireless will, will have a role either at the edge of the network or the core of the network. It all depends on the situation. So for the purposes of our discussion, when we're talking about wireless, we'll, we'll be primarily addressing licensed point-to-point -point technologies. And on the fiber side, uh, buried fiber or aerial fiber, as opposed to uh, dark fiber that you can lease. For the purposes of the discussion, we've elected to break these considerations into nine different categories. So we'll, we'll go through each of them and talk about where wireless makes sense and where fiber might make sense. Certainly time to market uh, is, is an important consideration and one where obviously wireless can have an advantage if time to market is very critical. Um, a wireless link can be installed in a matter of days whereas it can take uh, weeks or months to uh, not only construct the fiber, whether it's aerial or buried, but just the whole process of getting permits from local authorities to begin the project can take months, even years. So certainly in the time to market consideration, all else being equal, um, wireless is a, a better way to get to market. Popular misconception about wireless is that it doesn't offer the speeds that fiber does. And certainly uh, fiber, all again, all else being equal, fiber can offer a lot more speed than your typical wireless connection. But what's lost on a lot of people today with the advances that we've seen from a number of different vendors in wireless technology is multi-gigabit speeds can reliably be obtained up to 10 miles with point-to-point -point wireless technology. There's a variety of different ways to do that, and we'll be discussing some of them here. Uh, fiber also, although uh, it certainly can, can offer almost unlimited speeds, you will be limited by the type of equipment that is connected to that fiber and how that equipment can be upgraded and what the cost of that would be. So that's always an important consideration in a fiber network. Um, wireless technologies uh, are scalable, depending on how you're architecting them. And we'll show you different ways to do that. So according to the Department of Transportation, one recent study, the cost to deploy Fiber could be as much as $27,000 per mile. That would be for buried fiber. And some research I did where I tried to determine what it might cost to lease a 10 gigabit fiber link. Um, I found prices that varied on region and distance anywhere from $800 to $4,000 a month for a lease. Obviously, uh, a point-to-point -point wireless connection can be a lot less expensive than, than that. For example, common point-to-point -point licensed wireless technologies that offer up to 10 gigabits per second capacity, the equipment cost is averaging around $5,000 per link now. And even if you have to put a, you know, a, a mount up on a roof or the side of a building, it's still gonna be a fraction of the cost of deploying a fiber link. Another common misperception is that wireless doesn't have the latency of fiber, that 
fiber uh, offers better latency numbers than wireless. And when you think about the applications that are being used today, uh, you see why latency can be very important. Um, if you're working from home or taking classes at home, you're using video conferencing, latency is, is very important to the performance of those applications. Many people are using their broadband networks at home for streaming video. Again, latency is very, very critical. What is misunderstood is that wireless, point-to-point -point licensed full box wireless actually has better latency numbers than a fiber optic link. And uh, part of the reason for that is your typical fiber link isn't really a straight line. It has to go uh, around things. It has to go up and down. It has to be wound around strands. And so the, the distances are typically greater for the actual fiber optic cable than the point-to-point -point distance you're traveling. So, uh, in fact, I think proof of this is a lot of the uh, uh, trading applications where uh, uh, trading firms re rely on uh, microwave networks for their uh, in order to execute their trades quickly over long distances, microwave is relied on for that application a lot more than fiber is. Obviously, installation uh, of wireless can be a lot easier. Again, assuming if you already have your infrastructure in place, you have a tower to put the antenna or a rooftop to mount it. Um, installing the wireless link will require fewer resources than, than a fiber link um, where you might have to, in the fiber, um, you know, trench uh, around obstacles, uh, up hills, and across a variety of different terrain. Wireless typically offers an easier installation path. And of course, fiber um, typically is more susceptible to uh, outages than wireless. In, in a wireless link, you'll have only two endpoints typically, whereas in a fiber connection, you might have multiple points along the fiber route, uh, light poles, hand holes if it's buried fiber. And these are all, a lot more can go wrong with uh, construction accidents, uh, flooding, lightning, uh, ice damage, uh, whereas in a, a, a wireless link, your antenna could be covered in ice and it's still going to be operating at the predicted availability. So uh, common misperception is that wireless is less dependable than fiber, but if it's designed properly, you can actually get five nines or more reliability, which translates into just seconds per year of downtime. Now, both technologies are very suitable as a backup or redundant link. Um, you will often see fiber as the primary link. And because the costs have come down so much on wireless, equipment in the last few years, wireless is used as a redundant link to a fiber connection. Also, mission critical uh, organizations like utility companies and public safety entities like to use wireless for their uh, critical links, licensed wireless that is, because they're in control. They're in control of the entire link and uh, they can build in the reliability that they want. Um, wireless can be designed depending on the, the technology and the vendor that you're choosing. Uh, wireless systems can be designed to have no single point of failure with redundant components, redundant hardware, and redundant paths. Uh, so depending on how much uh, uh, reliability you need, 
there's many ways to architect a wireless network where it will not fail. Another common myth about wireless is that it's not as secure as fiber. And I think this probably uh, dates back to comparing today's wireless to the earliest iterations of Wi-Fi. And some people still kind of think of point-to-point -point wireless as having the same characteristics as those early Wi-Fi networks. Where in fact, point-to-point -point wireless has some inherent um, security built into it. So uh, every vendor that creates a point-to-point -point wireless uh, system has its own proprietary technology for uh, creating the packets that go across the, between the two antennas. So it's virtually impossible to buy something off the shelf that can intercept that signal and interpret it. So that, that, that is built in inherent security in every point-to-point -point wireless network. In addition to that, you can overlay technologies, technologies like AES-256 encryption, which can be done over fiber as well. Um, but many wireless uh, products have that encryption built into them if you want it. We'll talk a moment about aerial fiber. So if you live where I live in the Northeast, the first thing to come down in an ice storm is usually the telephone pole or the utility pole. And when you're uh, using aerial fiber, that's, that's where the fiber is uh, strung along the light poles and um, telephone poles. And when you think about a perhaps a 10 mile connection, think of the dozens of utility poles that you'll have to hang the fiber along that route. Whereas uh, in a wireless connection of 10 miles, you might only need two or three connection points along the way. So uh, less infrastructure to be impacted by something like a uh, severe ice storm. So having said all that, there are obviously places where fiber is really the only choice or an appropriate choice. And I kind of boil it down this way. Um, anything, if you need a multi gigabit connection of over five miles, fiber is really the only way to do that. There are some scenarios where if, the, if you have enough FCC channels available, you can get multi, -big, multi gigabit wireless connections over five miles, but it's rare. So if you need to go over five miles and you need multi gigabit, fiber is the best choice usually, especially if there is no line of sight. These point-to-point -point wireless technologies that we're talking about require direct line of sight. If you have no budget or time constraints, fiber is uh, a very good consideration. And if there's no infrastructure for mounting your antennas, so if there's no tower existing, no water tank, no building along the path that you can use, and these things would have to be built, um, in, in those scenarios, the cost of putting in the wireless network can sometimes approach the cost of putting the fiber in because of the, the, the cost associated with building the infrastructure. On the wireless side, uh, you can very reliably get multi-gigabit capacity under five miles with some of the technologies that are available today. And that's something that's kind of new. So that, that's really only in the last year or two have those types of technologies been available. And uh, for last mile connections where you need a gigabit, um, wireless is a very good option. For example, let's say you've got aerial fiber going along a road and then you wanna bring a gig capacity or 500 meg capacity to the home. And some of the homes might be thousands of feet off of that road down a long driveway. Well, as long as you have line of sight, there are some very good low cost compact technologies that will allow you to get up to a gigabit under a mile distance. So that can be a very good choice for going that last mile from a fiber uh, main route. 
if you're under time or budget constraints, as we've seen, wireless is certainly easier to put in and, and can be less expensive. And finally, if you have the infrastructure and line of sight is not an issue, and you want to go under five miles with multi gigabit, um, wireless is usually a much better, much less expensive option. So having discussed that, I just wanted to take you through a little bit about Saragon, who we are, and briefly um, some of the wireless solutions that we offer that can work in a multi-gigabit environment. Um, we're a publicly traded company. We are headquartered in Tel Aviv, Israel. We're profitable, no debt. And one of the signature uh, facts about Saragon is we have developed our own chipset, which gives us the ability to do things like uh, higher capacity channels and uh, get to the market quicker with uh, newer technologies. We operate in about 140 countries and uh, we uh, have about uh, a little over a thousand employees now. So one of the things we're, we're able to do with our licensed uh, 11, 18, and 23 gig radios is offer much wider channels uh, than ever before. Uh, so provided the FCC uh, has the channels available, uh, we can go into a market and actually get a 160 meg channel or a 200 meg channel, which would allow us to get uh, three to six gigabits in two plus O or four plus O configurations. Um, and depending on the frequency, even up to seven gigabits capacity over a, you know, a one to, let's say four or five mile link. So that's really unprecedented and, and something uh, we've only recently been able to do. And we're delivering that by using our, our new IP50 platform. So in the E-band, 80 gigahertz, 70 gigahertz, we can actually get 20 gigabit capacity. And that's at about 0.5.7 miles distance. But we are in one radio actually able to deliver at that distance 20 gigabit capacity. So that's that's kind of innovative in this in this space. The chipset that we have in development right now that probably won't be released until uh, late 2022 will actually be able to deliver 100 gigabit capacity in one radio. So that, that will be truly revolutionary. To kind of walk you through different scenarios. Um, again, for you know fiber extension or fiber backup. The 50E platform, which is operating in the E-band, can get 20 gig up to 0.7 miles. I think we're one of the only uh, E-band vendors now that has a native CIPRI, eCIPRI interface on our radio. So for uh, infrastructure providers that are building out small cell infrastructure for the larger carriers, that's very interesting because they can put in an Ericsson or a Nokia or Samsung RAN that uses CIPRI and, and our 50E radio can interface directly to that RAN and uh, use the CIPRI. Um, large enterprises is a, is a good market, campus, environments where uh, you need a gig to higher capacity over a short distance. And we, we've got a unique platform in that it can be deployed either as a split mount where the, as you see here in this example, the 20N is an indoor unit and the RFUE is a radio that is deployed up at the antenna. And uh, that could be at your hub site and it could be talking to an all outdoor 20E radio that is located on a utility pole or the top of a building uh, some distance away, um, delivering up to five gigabits of capacity. Okay. 
want to draw your attention to the right side of that, that last diagram where you see the IP20V. That's a very compact, low cost radio that operates in the V band, which is 50, 60 uh, gigahertz range. That will deliver uh, in a mile or less up to a gigabit capacity. So that's, that's ideal for going from a uh, utility pole or a street lamp or the side of a building to uh, connect that, that homeowner or, or business uh, off the end of your fiber network, delivering a gigabit capacity over a pretty short distance for a very uh, affordable price. 